In this video, we're going to be discussing hydraulic pumps, and in particular, we're going to be looking at the power consumption of pumps in order to achieve various different flow conditions. So pictured on the screen, we have a pump, and that pump is delivering hydraulic fluid from a lower reservoir into an upper reservoir. We've specified that the density of the fluid is 845 kilograms per meter cubed, and we're trying to achieve a delivery flow rate of 0.15 meters cubed per second. In addition, we've specified that the efficiency of the pump is 75%. Now, in order to calculate the power consumed by the pump, we need to understand a little bit more about the required delivery pressure. So we've specified that the pump needs to deliver the fluid through a pipework of length 1550 meters. And we've also specified that for every meter of length, there's a pressure loss of 35 pascals. So we're going to need to overcome those pressure losses. In addition, the pump needs to elevate the fluid through a maximum height of 25 meters. Now, if there was a larger quantity of fluid in that lower header tank, like so, then that would actually assist the pump because it would provide back pressure. But we're going to assume the worst case scenario, so we're going to assume that the lower tank is almost empty. Therefore, the pressure behind the pump is negligible when compared to the pressure upstream of the pump. So the formula that we use in order to calculate the power of the pump is as follows. Under ideal conditions, the power would be the volume flow rate times the change in pressure. However, when we introduce an efficiency, we need to divide that by the efficiency, meaning we need to provide more power in order to overcome the inefficiencies of the pump. So as we can see here, the flow rate is given and the efficiency is given. So all we need to calculate first of all is the pressure provided by the pump, also known as the delivery pressure. So the delivery pressure of the pump in this scenario, first of all, the pump needs to elevate the fluid through a distance of 25 meters. And the way that we calculate the pressure required in order to do that is by doing density times gravity times height. That's a formula that we've seen on a number of occasions and it should now be familiar to you. However, that isn't the only pressure that needs to be provided because we have a pressure loss of 35 pascals for every meter of length, and we have a length of 1,550 meters. Therefore, the additional pressure required is going to be the length times the pressure loss per meter of length. Now, you may recall from the tutorials on Bernoulli's equation that we also had a term that involved the velocity of the fluid. But if we look at the entry and exit to our pump, we can see that the fluid already has a volume flow rate as it enters the pump. And that volume flow rate is going to be matched by the fluid exiting the pump. Therefore, the kinetic energy of the fluid entering and exiting the pump is going to be the same. Therefore, we can disregard that term when calculating the delivery pressure for our pump. So substituting in some values, we have the delivery pressure or the change in pressure across the pump is the density, 845, times gravity, 9.81, times the change in height of the fluid, 25, plus the length of the pipe, 1550, multiplied by the pressure loss per meter of pipe giving us a change in pressure equal to 261,486. And that's in Pascals. I'm going to leave that in Pascals because we're actually going to reuse that value when we calculate the power. So the power then is the volume flow rate, 0 0.15 times our change in pressure across the pump, 261486, and we need to divide all of that by our efficiency as a decimal, 0 0.75, giving us a power consumption for our pump equal to 52,297, or expressed in kilowatts, that's 52.3 kilowatts. So in order to overcome our pressure losses and to elevate the fluid through a height of 25 meters, 
is going to be achieved when our pump is consuming 52.3 kilowatts of power. And as mentioned earlier, this is worst case scenario because if there was more fluid in the lower header tank, the fluid in the lower reservoir would assist the pump in that situation. So now that we understand the general function of the pump, let's take a look at a specific type of pump known as a reciprocating pump. So here we have pictured a reciprocating pump. And when we have a reciprocating pump, we can actually calculate the volume flow rate on various different characteristics about that pump. So first of all, let's consider how the reciprocating pump works. We have a piston which is mounted on a crank and as that crank rotates, the piston's going to retract and extend. So when the piston retracts or moves from left to right, oil is going to be drawn in through the lower pipe and into the cylinder. When that cylinder's retracting, it's going to cause the valve at the top to close and the valve at the bottom to open. Now, when that piston begins its forward stroke, the opposite's going to happen. The lower valve is going to close and the upper valve is going to open. And the force provided by the piston is going to push the fluid out through the discharge pipe like so. So the volume flow rate in this instance is going to be a product of the volume of the cylinder as well as the rotational speed of the crank. And in fact the formula that we use for this is volume flow rate Q equals A, the area of the piston head, L, the stroke length of the cylinder, M, the rotational speed of the crank, divided by 60. So if we use the data that's provided here, we can calculate the volume flow rate of this pump because the volume flow rate is the area of the piston head. Well, down in the bottom left hand corner, we've got a diameter of the piston head of 0.12 meters. That means that our radius is 0.06 meters. As it's a circular piston, the area is just pi times the radius squared. So pi times 0.06 squared. Next we have the stroke length of the cylinder and we have a stroke length of 0.25 meters. On our diagram, the stroke length is basically the length of this cylinder here. The longer the cylinder, the greater the volume of that cylinder. So we're going to multiply by the length of 0.25 and we're going to multiply by the number of revolutions every minute. In this case it's 450 revolutions every minute. And finally we divide by 60 for the number of seconds in a minute. Giving us a volume flow rate equal to 0.0212 meters cubed every second. We can also calculate the ideal power consumed by this pump. Note that an efficiency is not given, so we're going to make the assumption that it's 100% efficient. So the ideal power, P ideal. So the ideal power, once again, is the volume flow rate delivered by the pump multiplied by the delivery pressure of the pump. We've just calculated our volume flow rate, 0 0.0212. And our delivery pressure is specified as 5.5 bar. Recall that bar is times 10 to the 5. I'll just put that in brackets to remind us that it's in standard form. Therefore, the ideal power consumed by this pump equals 11,660 or 11.66 kilowatts. So let's make a note of our flow rate and the power consumed, and then we'll look at what happens if we decide to increase the rotational speed of the pump in order to increase the flow rate. So on the screen here, we have three additional formulas. The first formula connects rotational speed to flow rate, the second formula relates delivery pressure to rotational speed. And the third formula relates power to rotational speed. Now the subscript one and subscript two represent two different conditions. So let's say for example, the current rotational speed of 450 RPM 
and the current flow rate of 0 0.0212 represents position 1. But if we change those conditions, so as an example, if we change the rotational speed, then that's going to impact on all of the other variables. The important thing to note is that not all of these are linear relationships. We have a linear relationship between speed and flow rate, but that isn't true for the relationship between speed and pressure and speed and power, as we're going to see in a moment. So in this scenario, we're going to increase the rotational speed of our compressor, so N2, and we're going to increase it to 650 RPM. And what we're going to calculate is how that impacts on the flow rate, and we're also going to calculate how that impacts on the power consumed by the pump. So first of all, let's calculate the new flow rate, Q2. Now as the parameter I'm trying to find is on the bottom of a fraction, the first thing I'm going to do is take the reciprocal of each side. Now recall that when we take the reciprocal of a fraction, the bottom becomes the top, and the top becomes the bottom. Now providing we do that to both sides of the equation, it will remain balanced. So we have Q1 over N1 equals Q2 over N2. Now the next thing I need to do to each side to get Q2 on its own is multiply each side by N2. So I'm going to get Q2, the thing I'm trying to find, equals Q1 over N1 times N2. Now it's simply a case of plugging in my values, 0 0.0212 over the original rotational speed of 450 times the new rotational speed of 650, giving me a new flow rate equal to 0 0.0306. meters cubed per second. So where flow rates are concerned, we have a linear relationship. If we double the rotational speed, we double the flow rate as we would expect because we would be achieving more cycles every second. Next, we're going to calculate our power. So if we refer to the formula at the bottom, we want to calculate the new power consumption when the rotational speed of the pump is 650 RPM. So this time, the thing that we're trying to find is already on the top of the fraction. In order to get P2 on its own here, all I need to do is multiply each side, but I need to multiply each side by N2 cubed. So we're going to have the following, P2 equals P1 over N1 cubed, all multiplied by N2 cubed. Well, the original power consumption, you can leave this in kilowatts, 11.66 divided by the cube of the original speed, so 450 cubed, multiplied by the new speed, 650, again cubed, giving us a power consumption equal to 35.14 kilowatts. So what we see here is that in order to achieve a rotational speed which is roughly 50% higher, we need to provide the pump with more than three times the original amount of power. The important thing to note is that these three additional formulas that we've seen here would actually apply to any hydraulic pump.